Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I want to take the opportunity to thank SAGES and the organizing committee for allowing me to share our experience um, in this subject. We'll talk about pancreatic incidentalomas, something that, as I'll be discussing, has become much, much more frequent. I have nothing to disclose in regards to this lecture. Um, and why it has become more frequent? It's because significant advantages in imaging techniques and the significant um, increase on, on, his, on their use have discovered a lot of asymptomatic pancreatic lesions. And when you have a patient that in, is, is undergoing a study for something that of, of lesser importance, to tell them that they have um, a pancreatic lesion is one of the most scariest incidental findings. Um, this is going on its own. And the significance of the lesion really highly depends on the type of lesion that we're going to be dealing with. What are the first steps when you are referred a patient that they said it, had, it was undergoing an ultrasound of the abdomen and they found a lesion on, on the pancreas? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to reassure the patient. Because with the media talking so much about pancreatic cancer, that's the first thing that they have on their mind. And you tell them that usually that's not the case and you're going to be able to, um, to get a little bit more to the bottom of the history. You do have to have a direct and detailed history, history of pancreatitis, history of any member of the family dying from pancreatic cancer. Uh, some people had had an imaging study because of trauma in the past and, and when you just ask them to, to bring it to you, they, you see that the lesion was there and was unchanged. I am not moving this, this is moving by itself. Let me try to go back again. Then the next question you have to ask yourself is, is this solid or cystic? And then decide what kind of further workup you're going to do. The workup, it varies um, depending the institution and the surgeon's preference. However, I think the new MRI techniques with pancreatic sequences are probably among the best ones to obtain for the incidentaloma because it allows you to, to see the, not only the relationship with neighboring structures but also the, the characteristics of the lesion. Pancreatic protocol CT is a good alternative. Endoscopic ultrasonography today is a must. And one needs to make sure that deals with this in a multi-specialty fashion there's no longer the pancreatic surgeon that's going to do everything. Today, with the imaging studies and endoscopic ultrasound and the collaboration with the, and with the radiologists as well as the endoscopic ultrasonographies, we can get to the diagnosis on the majority of these cases. Other studies are, as I mentioned above. Now, in terms of the solid lesions, the large majority of solid lesions need to be surgically removed. I'm not going to talk too much about the, the neuroendocrine lesions because we have heard a, a very good exposure on the prior lecture. The to uh, totally benign solid lesions, they're, they're not common. They're usually neuroendocrine in nature or uh, some other types. Intermediate lesions we have discussed before, some other less common lesions, solid cellopapillary lesions, and then the malignant tumors. IPMN could be an a intermediate lesion or a or malignant tumor. This is a patient that came around three months ago to our practice, 18 year old, on priorly good condition of health. She had right upper quantum pain, ended having uh, cholelothiasis, uh, but the ultrasound discovered this very large mass in the pancreas and it was completely asymptomatic. It was a pseudopapillary uh, tumor. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I truly don't want to start again. And the video is not working. It worked in the speaker ready room. Well, you don't know what you are missing. It's a very good video. <laughs> I guess we're just going to have to skip. I'm sorry. And now it's not even going to the next slide. I know about this lecture, but I haven't memorized all the slides. Um, then talking about the cystic lesions of the pancreas. We have the serocyst adenoma, the mucinocyst adenoma, IPMN, pseudocyst, and cystic carcinoma. The ones that are benign are usually a serocyst adenoma and pseudocyst, and these are the usual characteristic genders, the peak decade of life, percentage of all cysts, and the malignant potential. The ones that are worrisome are the mucinocyst adenoma, the IPMNs, and the, obviously the cystic carcinoma. 
the majority of the incidental findings are going to be what we call side branch IPMN, and I will, uh, I will dedicate the, the last several slides to talk about IPMN. These are the typical cystic lesions. This is an IPMN of the tail with a dilated pancreatic duct. This is a cystic lesion that appears to be relatively smooth. However, when the endoscopic ultrasonography was done, there was a mural nodule. This is a patient that we have seen two days ago, and she's on the schedule for surgery when we come back, based solely on the presence of a mural nodule. Serocyst adenomas, they can be large. They can push the vessels, but they are usually totally benign. They are characteristic by the central stellate scar and the honeycomb microcystic appearance. Uh, they are non-mucinous. They are usually glycogen rich when you aspirate the contents, and the malignant potential is very low. They are usually asymptomatic, non-specific, and they do not require surgery unless they are growing. And this patient, for example, and again, you're going to miss another beautiful movie, um, this patient we did uh, he had a very large uh, cystic lesion on the head of the pancreas, and we did a local excision um, the preserving the pancreatic duct and the uh, common bile duct, and then just reinforcing the side wall of the duodenum because when you take this out, sometimes you have a little serosal tear, but the patient recovered uneventfully, and we prevented her from having um, pancreatic duodenectomy. What about the mucinocyst adenoma? Well, they, are, they can uh, become malignant or they can be malignant by the time of diagnosis. The CA is usually high. Um, the amylase is low. They can have intracellular mucin and ovarian stroma. And this is, the ovarian stroma is what it differentiates it from the IPMN that I'll be mentioning in a bit. They're usually asymptomatic, but they can present with acute pancreatitis because of obstruction of the duct. This is a low-grade mucinocyst adenoma of the body. And this is a very straightforward laparoscopic case where we did a wedge excision. You put a drain, margins are negative, and the patient doesn't require any other major central pancreatectomy or not. Of course, this is because of the location of the cyst. As you see, it was protuberant and, and coming out of the inferior edge of the pancreas. And again, I'm sorry, there's no video here. May I ask, is it possible to open the video files separately from the presentation, the gentleman in the back? No, not possible, okay. The, the video files were on the folder that I gave in the speaker ready room and we tested it in this the lecture and outside the lecture too, just in case you have access. But it's okay. Let's talk about IPMN. IPMN is described, for those of you that are not familiarized, as interductal mucinous containing epithelium with or without papillary projection involving the main pancreatic duct and or a major side branch lacking ovarian stroma. It's a long definition, basically, to a pathology that has become very commonly diagnosed in the last 10 years, and that in the past it was rare to know that the patients would have this. The importance of these lesions are that are a little bit like the polyp in the colon. They can develop into cancer. And the importance also is because these are the majority of the incidentalomas of the pancreas. Then I'm going to dedicate a little bit of time to talk about them. If they let me go to the next slide. The background, it was originally described in 1982, but really not recognized and classified until later, 1996. Um, it is differentiated, again, from the mucinocystic neoplasm. There has to be a communication with a pancreatic duct, either if it is a branch or a main duct. And I'll be repeating this because there's a completely different connotation in terms of prognosis and what you have to do if this is a main duct IPMN or is a side branch IPMN. The cumulative incidence is 2 in 100,000 inhabitants. You would say, well, that's very low. But if you go patients over 60 years old, it's really almost 1 in 1,000. Again, not of, the majority of them don't need intervention, but this is a significant um, uh, incidence. And this was in a study by K. Ray Lombardo from Mayo Clinic Rochester. At our institution, um, the, Dr. Raimondo, our gastroenterologist, uh, did a study showing that the median five-year survival of invasive IPMN was 24%, meaning this is IPMN turning to cancer, and from non-invasive IPMN, 94%. Then the question is, how do we differentiate which ones are going to be cancers and which ones are not? Because if you have a small side branch in the head, are you going to do a Whipple or not? And this is what we're going to discuss now. It's not going again, sorry. I promise I'm passing. Um, can you move them from there if I tell you next? 
Okay, then I'm gonna get my hand off. The definitions. Again, we talk about main duct IPMN, and that's when the dilatation of the pancreatic duct is one centimeter. The branch duct IPMN is gonna be with one of the branch duct ducts is, uh, presents a cystic that's communicating to it without any main duct dilatation, and sometimes you have mixed type IPMN. Next. The prevalence is very significant. If it is main duct, 57 to 92 percent. Branch duct, 6 to 46 percent. Next. The classification is the transition from adenoma to invasive carcinoma. Next. This is an adenoma, well-formed, well-defined. Next. This is a borderline. You can start seeing the, the protuberance of the cells. Next. High-grade dysplasia. This almost looks like cancer and sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate and it, according to many pathologies, this would be called uh, carcinoma in situ. Next. And then of course we have the invasive. Now it's away from the edge of the epithelium and you have an invasive carcinoma within an IPMN. Then this is now a very well recognized progression and this is where we can help patients to prevent from pancreatic cancer. Next. Then. What about the history? They are usually asymptomatic or have recurrent pancreatitis. They have a particular images, and I'll show you in a little bit, and they are mucinous papillary. Amylase could be high, CEA could be high, but these are not the reason to do surgery unless the CEA is really on the 800s. Initial series, if the CEA was elevated, we used to do surgery and we realized it's not a good marker. Next. The CT scan or MRI shows again a, a, a tail in this case, but with a dilated pancreatic duct. Next. This is, of course, an invasive cancer. It has even gotten into the spleen, and all of the pancreas is involved. Next. This is what you see on an MRCP. You can see the blocks of mucin that are obstructing the duct. Next. This is the papilla. This is very characteristic for the endocrinologist. You, I mean, for the gastroenterologist, you can see mucin uh, coming out of the papilla. And then you can see on the ERCP that there are areas that are not filled by the contrast, again, because of the fact that they, they are filling defects in dilated, dilated ectatic pancreatic ducts. Next. Intraoperative ultrasound, you can see that the cyst that we saw on that CT scan that appeared to be very smooth in intra, I mean, I'm sorry, not intraoperative, endoscopic ultrasound, you can see a mural nodule this is an indication for surgery, even on side branch IPMN, because that means that it's no longer producing only mucin, but there are now elongations, papillary elongations that could be cancerous. Next. This is in pancreatoscopy. This is the fish eggs look. Sometimes you cannot differentiate between chronic pancreatitis patient with a dilated duct versus this patient, and pancreatoscopy really differentiates the two. Next. 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 The gross pathology shows you a massively dilated duct with an prolong with a elongation, a papillary extension inside the duct. And in this case, you have a tumor invading the spleen. This is the case that I show you in the x-ray. Next. Now let's talk about now the differentiation. Main duct IPMN, we said it's very highly malignant. Two thirds are invasive. All of them should be resected. And these are eight recent series from Japan, Europe, and the United States. Everybody agreed you have main duct IPMN, you need to resect it. There's a little controversy on how extensive the resection should be. Should you do a total pancreatectomy in everyone or not? And I'm not going to get to the controversy right now, but it's basically when you do, uh, uh, if you're going to do a partial, you need to do a frozen section. If there's high, um, high grade dysplasia or carcinoma at the edge where you cut, then you need to complete, complete the total pancreatectomy. Next. Um, the predictors of invasive cancer before the surgery, um, these are p-values for all of this. Basically, if the patient is symptomatic, that means there's a higher occlusion, that it was a predictor. Other pancreatic disease, and we talk about main duct versus branch duct. Main and branch could be, if it is, on, if it is only branch, is not. A mural nodule, as I said, the cyst, the cyst size, and I'll talk a little bit more, and I already talked about the main duct size. Next. The, there were guidelines to decide what to do, again, with the side branch. The, the main branch, I already talked about it, but then the side branch IPMNs, which of those were going to do surgery? And again, this composed a very large majority of patients with, with incidental findings. If it is higher than three centimeters, or if it presents symptoms or mural nodules and is less than three centimeters, you should consider doing surgery. 
And then non-surgical management for less than three centimeters, again, with no symptoms or no mural nodules, regardless about CEA, unless the CEA is very large. Next. The consensus guidelines, again, from branch duct IPMN. Um, it was observation in asymptomatic patients, and this was published in one of the largest surges by Tanaka from Japan. Next. Less than one centimeter, what do you do then if they are less than three centimeters? How do you follow them? You follow them with, uh, if it is less than one centimeter, imaging studies every 12 months. Between one to two centimeters, we follow them six to 12 months. Greater than two centimeters, but less than three, every three to six months. Worrisome features, then we just take them to surgery. Next. Concluding comments, please. Yeah. Next. In conclusion, uh, we have become more common the, this incident, pancreatic incidentalomas have become more common problem presented to the surgeon, require a multidisciplinary team approach. The diagnosis should be reached, if not with certainty, at least with high degree of probability. Solid lesions tend to require surgery. Cystic lesions need further workup, and as I mentioned, main branch IPMN surgery, side branch follow the guidelines. Thank you very much.